Your light shines through all darkness, my darkness, like a fire, it consumes all my fears and my failures. Your grace overwhelms like a flood straight from heaven. Your hope opens eyes to the floodgates of heaven. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels to sing your praise. Overthrown is the power of darkness. All darkness lost its hold when you came with your kindness and your goodness. Your love breaks the chains of my heart, of my mind, and your power sets free all the captives and you bring peace. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens declare your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels to sing your praise. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels to sing your praise. Sing together, oh my soul will sing. And oh my soul will sing. Oh my soul will praise you. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. This morning, I'd like to take a moment to read from the book of Psalms. We're going to read uh, chapter 97, verses 1 through 5. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. This passage uh, starts with something that's very important. Um, and, and it reads that the Lord reigns. Let all the earth rejoice. Um, this is a truth that really needs to resonate in our hearts, talking about how God reigns over everything and every person. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to sing this song called King of Kings. Um, the verses talk about really the story of the gospel. Um, and in the chorus, we talk about how God is over everything um, and over everyone. And this psalm says the same thing, that God reigns, let the earth rejoice. Our response to God reigning um, in our lives is that we should worship him and rejoice inside of that. We should celebrate that. And then the psalm goes on to talk about the clouds and the fire and the lightning and even the, the mountains um, melting like wax. Um, God is in control of everything. And because of that, he deserves our obedience and our worship. So with this psalm in mind, let's continue to sing and worship our Lord together. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes 
to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise a father praise a son praise a the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To the stones move for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected me. Join me, if you would, this morning by turning in your Bible to Psalm 93. We will begin a new sermon series this morning on the foundations of the Christian faith. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Pray with me. Holy God, ruler of all, we worship you this morning. We give you praise and honor for who you are. You are trustworthy. You are a promise keeper. And we thank you for all the mighty ways that you are working in your world, in your people, in your church today. Please open our hearts and minds now as we study your word. Would the message from Tom and the meditations of his heart bring you glory 
and may it draw us closer to you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Like most Americans, I don't know a great deal about my heritage, but um, I do know that most of my ancestors, at least for the last couple of hundred of years, couple hundred years, have uh, come from the British Isles. And as a result, I've always been kind of an Anglophile. I like British history. I enjoy reading English literature. And the one time I went to the United Kingdom, I felt more at home than I uh, felt in any other country except Canada, eh? And um, I'd have to say, despite that, that there is one thing that I simply cannot understand about the Brits, and that is their intense love and devotion for the royal family. I know that I am an American in the core of my being because I am so proud that we got rid of their king 250 years ago and I can't for the life of me figure out why those people keep hanging around. I mean, how they would be willing to pay millions of pounds every year to feed and clothe and house that very assortment of common human people who are made up of very nice people and scalawags, just like all the rest of our families, I, I will never figure out. And if you add to it this um, conviction that the British people seem to have that these folk are not just common human clay like the rest of us, and they don't just pull on their shorts one leg at a time like the rest of us is um, something that's astounding to me. But of course, um, all that you have in the UK at the present time is a constitutional monarchy where the sovereign has no real power. He or she is just kind of a figurehead. And really, since World War I, that's all that's left in the world. All the world's uh, monarchies have become constitutional monarchies. And that only adds to our problem. It adds to the problem that we feel when we read the words of this psalm that were just read to you, that start, the Lord reigns. After all, the modern world, and particularly Americans, are not too excited about monarchies to begin with. And uh, royalty doesn't exist with any of the kind of power it once had. And so we have trouble with this concept that God is a king. Now, I happen to agree with Winston Churchill. He was prime minister of uh, the United Kingdom during World War II. He once said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those others that have been tried from time to time. <laughs> what he, he meant by this is that we live in a fallen world, and because we live in a fallen world, any form of government that concentrates too much power in one person or one branch is bound to lead you into problems. Democracy involves a form of government in which the power is spread out among a number of agencies and a number of individuals. The truth is, because human beings are sinful, it is best to spread power around and have, as we use in our Constitution, checks and balances. But I have to tell you, that's not what the Bible says about government. We would have to gather from the, from the Bible that the best form of government is a benevolent monarchy. And the reason we know that is that that is the form of government with which we will end. The Bible story ends with the return of Christ and the rule of God himself over human life. And it reminds us of that with these words, the Lord reigns. Now the reality that God is king is basic 
to biblical faith. And that's why we're starting with this series uh, on that subject, the Lord's Rule. This, this series we're starting today is called Base Camp. And a base camp is something that uh, you establish at the base of a mountain that contains all of the elements that will be needed by the hikers who will then seek to make their way up the mountain. And the idea is that we would like to establish a kind of base camp as Christians. That is, we would like to lay out all of the truths that we need as Christians in order to be able to move forward and to climb the mountain, so to speak, of the Christian life. And so we have to start with this idea, this basic idea, God rules. God rules. To say that God rules is to assert that we have to begin by stretching our minds around the fact that something that we really don't want right now is something that ultimately we do want. Um, when it comes to God and his kingdom, he is a king. We, if we are believers, are looking forward to his reign and he will reign in power. Given the variable qualities of human nature, we may not want that kind of government now because a monarchy can be good if the person is good, can be evil if the person is evil, or more likely between those two poles, if the person is of varying nature, you're going to get kind of uh, the mediocrity that usually happens. But ultimately, the Bible tells us we long for a government in which goodness and power are combined in one supreme ruler. And so this psalm tells us about that. It tells us three things about God's rule. It tells us that God's rule is powerful and is effective and it demands a response. God's rule is powerful, God's rule is effective, and God's rule demands a response. First, it is powerful. Look at the first two verses of this psalm. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Now you have to remember this psalm, like all of the psalms, is a song that was meant to be sung by faithful people as they meet together to worship God. And the point that is made in these two verses is that the Lord reigns in majesty and might over the world that he has established. He is robed in majesty. He's belted, so to speak, with strength or with might. And this has been true from the moment he created the world. It's not that there was any change in the nature or character of God, but a ruler is someone who has <clears throat> a dominion to rule over. When God established the world, that is the universe of which our earth is a part, he became king. And the Lord reigns over the world he's established with majesty and might. Now we have to note that whenever this psalm was written, and we don't know when it was written or who it was written by, the conditions of the world could not have been very different than they are right now, today. And what I mean is this, in general, human beings in this world do not recognize the power of God and of God's rule. They don't submit to it. Uh, the leaders of the various nations don't get up in the morning and, and their first thought be, how can I establish and display God's rule over everything? No, they get up and they think of their policies and their power, and they seek to do whatever they need to do in order to establish and extend their policies and their power, and only a very small number give more than a lip service to the reality of God's powerful control in the course of history. So we have to note this psalm is not a statement of reality. It's a conviction, a conviction for people of faith. The world sees life as um, a series of unconnected chance events, a chaos of um, accidents, mundane incidences, and uh, fortuitous events that somehow happen haphazardly. They have no meaning at all, and our 
goal in life is to make our way through those things, to respond to those things as best we can as we make our way through this world and try to make the world a better place. But a person of faith hears the words of Jesus and understands that what we see and what we perceive from day to day is not necessarily all that is true. Jesus said, uh, God knows the death of one sparrow, that he numbers the hairs on your head. Fear not, he says, you are of more value than many sparrows. The truth is, God is so intimately involved in life, the Bible tells us, that he knows everything about you. Even all of those things about every aspect of your person that you know nothing about. And if you are one of his own, he acts for your eternal well-being. Everything must come together for your benefit, the Bible says. The Lord reigns. The Christian life is one long pilgrimage, you might say, of choosing to live by this conviction. As we walk through a barren world, rather than living by the conviction that uh, what we are experiencing is just the chaos of haphazard events, Jesus assures us when he says, fear not, that that is not the case. Life is not a series of haphazard events for those who love God and for whom God is everything the Lord reigns in majesty and might. So this is a conviction now. It's something that we are meant to sing as the people of God. But in the eternal kingdom of God, it will become the reality. Philippians 2 says to us that the day will come when every being will bow in submission. Those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth. That is in hell. All. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what you and I are called to do right now is to live by a conviction that is not owned widely throughout the world, but it is the reality that will exist then when God rules. We're asked to live out of a reality of God's rule by showing it in the way that we live and the way that we treat other people. Note how it refers to God's majesty and to his strength. This is like noting together that God has both the title to rule, he is the Lord, he is the creator, and he has the ability to rule, he has the strength. It's like acknowledging that he has both authority and power. In the metaphor of the psalm, it's like a, a king putting on his royal robes and his crown. And these things display who he is and what he is capable of doing. That's what the image is meant to convey. The Lord reigns in majesty and might over the world that he has established. His reign is powerful. The next thing we note in the psalm is that the Lord's rule is effective. Look at verse 3. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the waters, the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Many interpreters see in this psalm, and I think correctly, a veiled attack on Canaanite religion, the fertility religions that surrounded the ancient people of God there in Palestine, the ancient religions with which they sometimes flirted. In the Canaanite myths, Baal, their chief god, had to fight the sea god and the river god in order to bring them under control and create the world. That was a part of their creation myth, you might say. The living God had no such need to do that. He spoke and these things were controlled. The rivers here translated floods and then later the sea described water in its incredible power. You can think of the waves of the sea crashing against the shore and eating away the shore over time. You can, you can think of a swollen river coursing its way down and as it goes it changes direction, it wears away rocks and earth to accomplish its purpose. 
the psalmist assures us, and faith tells us to confess the words of verse 4, mightier than the, the thunder of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. In other words, as mighty as the uh, seemingly uncontrolled and uncontrollable powers of nature are, the Lord is more powerful than those things. He's mightier than all the forces of nature and their gods. Because in reality, all that Canaanite religion was, what it was, was the, the personification of the forces of nature. The river was a god. The sea was a god. The sun was a god. And they somehow put all these things together. And, and, and the Bible tells us the true God is the one who controls all these forces of nature that he himself has created and established. This tells us that God's work is powerful and supremely effective. The Lord's work is powerful and supremely effective. What was true then is true now. I mean, you might think of these words and they're describing something that pagans around them would have thought, uh, the power of the waters, as though there were a God behind it, and think, well, that's so long ago and far away, and I can't imagine anyone thinking that way. But the fact is, times do not really change. What people have done now is they personify the forces of nature in a different way. They create philosophies that attempt to explain life without God as though nature itself were a living thing that somehow is able to move forward and upward. They use philosophies. Even science itself is harnessed as a way of explaining the origin and the meaning and the destiny of life. And really, if you think about it, secularism or scientific uh, materialism, which are so prominent today, which cause people to turn away in droves from belief in God and the spiritual realm, are simply a way of leaving God out. They attempt to convey a comprehensive understanding of life in which there's no need for God. But this psalm says that, just like Baal and the Canaanite fertility myths. Those things as well are under the supreme power of the living and true God. No one and nothing else will ultimately have authority over human life because God reigns. God is simply the one who already has it. Perhaps even in these words, there's... Um, a veiled reference to how it is that God shows his power. If you think about it, the image of the raging water, the reference to a swollen river, the raging of the sea, they describe work that is not discernible in one day or one week or even one year. They have to be observed over decades, centuries, millennia, in order to see how powerful they really are. You know, archaeologists sometimes in studying ancient cities, and there are cities in the world that have been around for literally four or 5,000 years. And many of those cities, if they are seaports, which is in the ancient world where the most important cities were, what they find is that the ancient ruins of the city that has existed over millennia are far out to sea. That the city has itself moved back what we would have thought of as inland, even though there's still seaports, as the sea has eaten away the shore in many places. And what that tells us is that water is incredibly powerful, but it's not discerned in a brief period of time. It's seen over centuries and millennia. And in the same way, I think it's implying the Lord's work is not always observable, much to our frustration. During the days of our lives, the shaping that God does, he does in both individuals and in the life of nations. He does that over years and decades and even over centuries. We dare not judge whether God is actively at work simply by checking from day to day to see what the changes have been. So what do we learn from this psalm? Well, first we learn that the, the Lord's rule is powerful. The Lord reigns in majesty and might over the world he's established. And secondly, we see that the Lord's work is effective. The Lord's work is powerful and supremely effective. And in the final verse, in stating another truth about this, 
the psalmist calls us to a response. The Lord's work requires from us a response. And what he says essentially is that because the Lord reigns supreme, his word must be obeyed and he must be worshiped in holiness. Because the Lord reigns supreme, because his work is powerful and effective, his word must be obeyed and we must worship him in holiness. What does he say? Verse 5, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. First, he notes that the Lord's word is to be trusted. Your decrees are very trustworthy. This means that what God has revealed to us in the scriptures can be trusted and ought to be trusted by us to give us the direction that we need for our pilgrimage through this barren world. The simple deduction from this is that because the Lord reigns, he should be obeyed. Because he created us, he should be obeyed. Because God is the one who is both the creator and the sustainer of life. He's not one who created the world and flung it out there to just work its own clock out. He's a God who rules it every moment by his providence, the Bible says. And because of that, we should obey him. For most of us, obedience is not difficult when we find the things that he tells us to do to be things we already agree with. If we were brought up in a home in which we were taught that we ought to be kind to people, we ought to work hard, and in that case, we don't find being kind and working hard when the Bible tells us to do that to be things that are difficult because they're simply underlining and confirming beliefs that we already have. But today, increasingly, we are confronted with so many topics about which our world is giving us alternate ways of thinking from what the Bible tells us. There are many subjects about this, but matters of sexual morality obviously stand front and center at the present time. And these are the things we have to allow God to speak to us about. And then we need to seek to alter the course of our lives. If you're struggling with a subject that might fall in this category, something possibly where your background and your convictions and your friends, maybe even your family, those things don't line up with what you read in the Bible, let me encourage you to do two things. The first thing you need to do is to understand what the Bible teaches on that subject. Don't just assume you understand it because of one verse that you came across. Spend some time seeking to understand that particular topic and what the Bible actually says. Don't simply accept the view that the Bible is just an outmoded antique book that's been superseded by modern science and things like that by the passing of time. After all, you really have to understand what it is the Bible says. If you're not convinced about what it says, that it is God's direction for life, that it is ultimately for our good and for our flourishing as human beings, then you'll have little incentive to do what it says. But once you've thought it through and you know that it's God's word, then you need to seek to alter your life to bring it in line with what the scripture says. And this, of course, is where the real difficulty comes in. And that's why you need the fellowship of other people. That's why you need small groups, and you need books, and you need uh, tapes or podcasts, and you need uh, uh, meetings with other people in order to seek to understand these things. And ask the Lord to strengthen you, to give you both understanding and the ability to do what he has commanded. That's the first thing. The Lord's word is to be obeyed because of his rule. And because God rules, the second thing is he is to be worshipped with a holy life. That's what it says, holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. That word befits is an interesting word. It means it suits God's house, his presence. It fits with God. To walk with God, to enjoy his presence, his smile on your life as you walk through life requires that you pursue the kind of lifestyle that is suited 
to being in the presence of the God who is both powerful and good because he's holy. You know, of all religions, only those based on this book or ones that have been derived from it make any connection between individual lifestyle and worship. And that's because it's built into the concept of the Bible. Only the biblical revealed religion in which God spoke to human beings through his prophets, in his word, connects true worship with holy living. And that's the foundation. That's the starting point in learning about God and seeking to know God. That's the first element of establishing a base camp in your life from which you can progress to seek to climb the mountain of enjoying God and fellowshipping with God. We have to start by acknowledging the most basic concept the Bible presents, and that is that God rules over human life. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, as we bow our hearts before you, we thank you that this is true. Our hearts tell us. We long to know that there is, in fact, a benevolent, good, and strong power who reigns over life that all of the varied things that we face in life are not just haphazard chance events, but they are part of a tapestry that you are making in which the whole story of humanity will be revealed from beginning to end. And each one of us will be a thread in that tapestry. We pray that you would help us both to understand this and, and then to seek to live as we move through life by this truth that you rule over human life. And that because that is true, we ought to frame our lives around your word and what it tells us. And that we ought to seek to be the kind of people who reflect your character and enjoy your presence. And we pray this in Jesus' name. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood pulled down for us the weight of every curse upon him when final breath he gave Heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away. Perfect love could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted. The stone was rolled away, his 
perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. time of giving this week, the finance team and the elders wanted me to bring you a brief update on the church's financial condition. I'm happy to report that our church continues to be in excellent financial health, and that's due in large part to the generous contributions that you've been giving over the last three weeks under difficult circumstances when we weren't meeting in person. Second, I wanted to assure you that the finance team and the elders have been prayerfully and carefully monitoring the budget and our expenses to be sure that we maintain good stewardship in these uncertain times. Third, I wanted to let you know that we'll be providing a regular report of giving in the Grace Vine, beginning with the Grace Vine that went out this week. Finally, and most importantly, I wanted to let you know that we were all genuinely moved by the generous contributions that have come in over the last three weeks. We've all been blessed to see the hand of God working through each one of you as he opened your hearts and you gave generously as you felt led by the Spirit. So now please join me as I pray for our offering this week. Father God, we give you thanks for sustaining our church by working in the hearts of your people. We give you thanks for hearts of gratitude for all of the blessings you've given us and especially for the financial gifts that sustain our church through this difficult time. We ask that you would bless these gifts in the name of your Son, our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Good morning, Grace Church. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that it's been an encouragement for you and that it fills your heart and your mind with truth and with uh, joy. Uh, we're going to move into a time of giving this morning here at Grace Church. We believe giving is a part of our regular worship. And I just want to read this passage for us before we give. It's from the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 25. It says this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Uh, God doesn't only ask us as believers to give towards others. He actually says that he will refresh us as we give. And that's our hope this morning that uh, when we go into this time of giving, that God will also refresh your heart as you give towards others. Let's pray over the offering uh, this morning. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for the chance to be together in this way. Uh, we pray that you would um, fill our hearts with great joy and gratitude and that we would give out of hearts uh, that are filled with grace and that we give grace towards other others because of that. Uh, God, would you use these gifts for your purposes, for your kingdom glory, and we trust that you will. Um, and we just pray for our hearts in that process as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that you are managing the shutdown of life well as time goes on. I'm sure that, like me, you're finding to be increasingly difficult to do that, and yet we have glimmers in the news that eventually this is going to end. Until then, uh, those of us who are in leadership in the church, the elders and the staff, we're praying that God would sustain each one of those who are connected to our church would provide you with wisdom and grace to follow him in these difficult times. Why don't you bow for a word of benediction from the letter to the Hebrews. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God show you his grace this week.